Good morning, church family. A little confusion about the special music for the Waller family. We're going to do that, and uh, since Mimi broke her foot, uh, they are juggling that around. So we will sing a special music in our hearts. Amen? Well, this morning I have a message entitled, Freedom's Freedom. And uh, I, I'm thankful today for the freedom that we have. How, my, how about you? And this nation was built around freedom. It was built out of the ashes of political and religious tyranny of Europe. And we are thankful today for those who have given their lives for that freedom. Amen? Amen. And there is a freedom that we have in America that is unrivaled in the history of humanity. What do you think? But I would say this morning that it is not, it is not rivaled, or rather it is rivaled, I should say, by what I believe to be a greater freedom that we have, and that is a freedom in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so, as Americans, are we free today? How many of you are thankful for that freedom? But I have a question for you this morning. Are you really free in Christ? Because you might be free as an American, and we're thankful for that freedom. It's a blessing. But you also still could very well be a slave to your own self. And so we're going to look at today a message entitled, Freedom's Freedom. Because with freedom comes responsibility. How many of you believe that to be true? So we're going to dive into that this morning. I'm going to kneel today. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads wherever you are. We're just going to ask the Lord's blessing to be with us. Father in heaven, today we are grateful for the truth that sets us free. We're thankful for Jesus Christ who sets us free. We're thankful for the freedom that we have as Americans, all united together under one banner, the freedom that was purchased at a very high price, And Lord, today I just want to ask that your Spirit would anoint these lips, that they may speak words from heaven, and that the Spirit of God may speak to our hearts today. You may open our eyes to the truth that you want to reveal to us. So Lord, draw close to us, we pray, in a very special way. And may your Spirit settle our hearts. May you open our ears and open our souls to hear your voice, we pray. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. Want to invite you this morning to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 4. What do we do with liberty? How many of you appreciate liberty and freedom? But what do we do with it beyond just simply enjoying it? How many of you think that there might be something the Lord wants us to do with our liberty? beyond just enjoying it ourselves. I mean, think that would be the true truth. Amen? So turn with me to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 18. I did a little word study as I was preparing on this message, uh, a little word study on freedom and also on liberty. And the Bible says some pretty amazing things about it. Of course, I'm not going to exhaust that today, but I just want to look at a few thoughts. But Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 We're going to see here even the words of Jesus. Uh, I'm just going to start in verse 16. It says, So he, speaking of Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so when Jesus came, when he presented himself as the Savior of the world, he spoke about liberty, didn't he? We speak about liberty this weekend, and friends, Let me tell you something, just to be clear, the 4th of July is more than about fireworks, veggie dogs or hot dogs, and chips and barbecue. 
There's a history behind it. There's a religious history that is revealed in Revelation chapter 12 that tells us that that liberty which we are so thankfully experienced was provided through a divine intervention. Amen? The liberty and the freedom that we have in America was ordained by God Himself. He set it up, He organized it, He designed it, and as I mentioned the other night in our class, we talked about the United States and Bible prophecy, that it's, it's, it's very ironic that these, this continent sat over here for hundreds of years, with very thousands of years really, with very little occupation. Uh, there were the natives here, but as a massive population, it was basically empty. And as the tyranny of religious and political persecution got worse and worse over in Europe, God opened up through Revelation chapter 12. It says that the woman was persecuted, but the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood that was taking place. God ordained this nation to be a refuge in the last days for those who were seeking religious and political freedom. How many can say amen? So it was ordained by God. It was designed by God. The timing was of God. And those people who came over here were blessed by God. How many of you agree with that? And so God has ordained this nation to be a last day refuge of freedom for people to worship according to their conscience. Now if you read the rest of the prophecy, you find that that freedom is very rapidly what? It's declining, isn't it? It's, it's going away, and we see it happening before our very eyes. We enjoyed it for a very long time. But let me just say today, friends, that the freedom that we experience would not be possible, A, well, certainly because of those who have died to give us that freedom, but there, the greater freedom comes from God. Amen? And Jesus, when He came to this earth, He spoke about liberty. And I believe that greater than political liberty is spiritual liberty. Amen? Jesus says, He's anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor, to heal the brokenhearted. If your heart is broken today, Jesus has liberty for you. If your heart is broken today because of a marriage, because of a circumstance, because of some trial you're going through, because of a history of plague, whatever, Jesus says today, I have come for that purpose, to give you liberty, to give you healing for your broken heart. He says, and recovery for the sight of the blind, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Are you a captive today? You know, there's lots of people today who bask in what they think is freedom, but they are not experiencing a deeper freedom that only Christ can give. The freedom that America offers is wonderful, but it is not the ultimate freedom. It is not the ultimate freedom. Jesus goes on to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus proclaimed liberty. Now, I want, to make, I want you to understand this, but you can only give liberty if you have liberty yourself. Yes or no? Jesus possesses the greatest amount of freedom, and he gives it and offers it to us. How I many of you can say amen to that? So he offers it to us, and you can never give freedom unless you first what? Have freedom. America has give, brought democracy to many nations, but it could not have done that if it was under tyranny. Yes or no? And so the one who possesses the greatest freedom is Jesus, and he came to give it to you and to me. If you're a captive this morning, he offers you freedom. Now go with me to the next verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. That's the first point we want to make, that Jesus possesses liberty, he gives liberty. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. This is a very powerful verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is the, what? Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what, friends? There is liberty. Only the Lord can give true liberty. So it doesn't matter if you're an American citizen or you're a citizen of some other free country, if you do not possess the Spirit of God, 
you're not free. And the other half of that is, if the Spirit of God does not possess you, you are not free. Because only where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. And that's why, friends, America has enjoyed such wonderful freedom over the last couple hundred years, because they have had who? The Lord. The Lord led this nation. He led its leaders. But now the leaders are beginning to push away. The leaders are beginning to close off the door to religious freedom. And the Spirit of the Lord will be what? It will be withdrawn. If you don't possess the Lord, if you don't know Him, you are not free. You are in slavery. No matter how much you think you're free, you are not free. Freedom has never been about our circumstances, has it? Yes or no? Are you guys awake today? You're not thinking about the fireworks yet, are you? Okay. Freedom has never been about your circumstances. Freedom is always about your condition. Amen? If you go with me in the book of Acts, go with me to the book of Acts, and we're going to be in chapter uh, 19 here. Chapter 19... No, no, not chapter 19. Chapter 22. Chapter And verse, we're going to start in verse uh, 12. Where are we? I'm, I'm in the wrong chapter here. Pardon me for just a moment. Chapter 24, my bad. Here we go. I had the wrong chapter written down here. All right, chapter 24, we're going to go into verse 14. Paul is here is speaking to Festus and Felix, and he's in chains. And I love what he says to Felix and Festus. Notice this, verse 14. He says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Now after many years I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, and in the midst of which some of the Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither a mob or a tumult, and they ought to have been there before you the object they had anything against me. Or else, let those who are here themselves say, if they have found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless... For this one statement which I cried out, standing among them. Down to verse 22. Uh, when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysus the commander comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded them, the centurion, to keep Paul and let him have liberty, and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came... With his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him con concerning the faith of Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment of come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a more convenient time, I will what, friends? I will call you. And there's another passage where Paul is there and he's making his confession about accepting Jesus. And they basically say to him, Paul, you're what? You're crazy. They say, you've gone mad. And Paul says, I would, I am, he basically makes the point, I am free, and I wish that you were all like me except for these what? Chains. Paul was in chains. But notice what he says. He says back up here in verse 16, he says, this being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. That, my friends, is true freedom. Yes or no? 
to have a clear conscience before God and men, irregardless of your circumstances, that is true freedom. That is the freedom that Jesus wants to give us. That is the liberty that He proclaims. That is the freedom that He offers. There's many people today who are walking around, and some of them might be in this room, who have lots of money, have, have a good job, who has a high status in the community, but you are slaves because you do not have a clear conscience before God and men. Paul could stand before some of the great kings of history in chains and say, I am freer than you are. I am more free than you claim to be. We can be the king in the highest court and still be a slave to our lower passions. Friends, you don't have true freedom unless you can stand before men and God with a clear conscience. How many of you have freedom today? Freedom's more than just being an American citizen. Freedom is more than just receiving political freedom from a nation. But freedom is having a clear conscience of the mind because it is the mind that has the ability to enslave us more than anyone on this earth can free us. Only God can free us from that kind of slavery. And that's exactly what Jesus wanted to do. How many of you are thankful for that today? Amen. So freedom is never about your circumstances. You might be in jail, but you can still be what, friends? You can still be free. You might be in the highest palace on earth, and you can still be a slave. Sla freedom does not come from within it can only come from where? It can only come from above. Look with me in Galatians chapter 5. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. And verse 1. Roman, uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. He says in verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of what? A yoke of bondage. Some people say that freedom is being able to do whatever I want. want. But this is not actually correct. Because true freedom, now mark my words here, true freedom always comes with a significant level of restraint. Yes or no? What do you think? Is that true or yes or no? Because freedom is being set free and then choosing not to go back into the yoke of what? Bondage. And the only way to go back, to avoid going back into the yoke of bondage is to have and practice some sort of self-restraint. Paul, when he was speaking to Festus and, and, and Felix, he was saying to them, the Bible says he was reasoning with them about righteousness, justice, and self-what? Control. Are you with me, yes or no? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So true freedom is never simply doing what I want. It always involves self-restraint. Why self-restraint? For the good of myself, but also for the good of who? For the good of others. Amen? So true freedom is a vehicle in which good is exercised and evil is restraint. True freedom chooses to practice restraint from evil, knowing that if I, if I, if I am free to do that wrong thing, that wrong thing is going to bring me back into what? Into bondage. Now, if I have freedom, can I still choose to do the wrong thing, yes or no? Do I have freedom to do that? Sure I do. As a Christian, as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, do I have the freedom to go out and drink a pint of vodka, yes or no? I have the freedom. But once I yield that freedom to that thing which is wrong, which is evil, what does it bring me into? It brings me into bondage, is it, and is there any freedom in bondage, yes or no? There's no freedom in bondage. So in order to maintain my freedom, there must be a choice to practice self-control and self-what? Restraint. How do you see that to be true, yes or no? So many people today want to think that my freedom entitles me to do whatever I want. But you know, friends, freedom is not earned, it's given. And when it's given, it doesn't really belong to you. It belongs to the one that gave it to you. And Jesus came to give what? 
He came to give liberty. So really, the liberty that you possess really belongs to Him. So how many of you think that we ought to be wise stewards of our freedom? How many of you think that? Amen? Let's go to our next verse. And before we go there, I want to make this point. That true freedom requires a self-restraint that cannot come from the outside, but can only come from where? It can only come from above. And once again, friends, the freedom that we have in this nation is not simply because of those who gave the sacrifice, although a major part of it, but it was God-ordained, amen? Because true freedom comes from where? comes from above. Now, look with me in the same chapter, same book, verse 13. Chapter 5, verse 13, he says, For you, brethren, have been called to what? To liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Self what? Control. Self-restraint. And that self-control and that self-restraint is a fruit of the Spirit which can only be given by God. It's not something we can accomplish on our own, right? We have to receive it from God. But he says, do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. With true freedom comes the responsibility of caring for who? Caring for others. When Cain killed his brother Abel, and God came to Cain, and he said, where's your brother? God knew where he was, didn't he? God knew that he was laying on the ground, his blood spilled upon the soil. But he wanted Cain to think about it. And Cain said, Cain said, what? Am I my brother's keeper? What was the answer to that question? Yes. Someone in the church is going on a path they shouldn't go down. Someone in church missing multiple Sabbaths. Someone in church is making not so wise choices. God says that freedom and liberty in Christ compels us to seek out the good for one another and not to use it as an opportunity for the flesh to devour. Amen? I'm thankful this church understands that principle. But I still want to make the point because there's always going to be a few scragglers in every crowd. Stragglers, I should say. Right? But it says, do not use the freedom that Christ has given you as an opportunity of the flesh to destroy one another, to speak evil of one another, to, 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 to blast one another, but in love to seek each other's good. Amen? When he was with Jesus at the end of Judas' life, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. Jesus knew as he washed his feet that right after he washed his feet, Judas was going to go right out and betray him. And yet, Jesus did not expose him, did he? Him. Judas, when he... when. Uh, when uh, the, well, Mary came in and she broke the oil and she poured it upon Jesus' feet, Judas said, what a waste. Jesus did not expose him, but in love he preserved him. It doesn't mean he didn't address the issue, but he addressed it in a way that would not This is the type of responsibility that Jesus calls us as brothers and sisters in Christ to attain to to seek out one another's good, even though the brother may be wrong, not to use it as an opportunity of the flesh to harm one another or to lead others further astray, but to draw all unto Christ that we might receive healing from our broken hearts. How many of you are thankful today that God calls us, when he calls us to liberty, he calls us as an opportunity to do good. True freedom is about serving one another, amen? True freedom is about practicing... Christian charity. It's about having a responsibility towards others to restore and redeem them to Christ. What do you say, friends? How many can believe that to be true this morning? Amen? Don't use your liberty to destroy someone else. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And notice here, 
what Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 29. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 29. Paul says, Conscience, I say, not your own, but that of the other. For why is my liberty judged by another man's conscience? But if I partake with thanks, he's talking about food offered to idols here. If I partake with thanks, why am I evil spoken of for the food over which I gave thanks? Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Verse 32, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be what? That may be saved. Now let me make this point. What Paul is not saying here is he's not saying it's okay to compromise the truth of God in order to try to win somebody, okay? Some people have tried to use this verse to say, well, it's all right to go ahead and eat unclean meats if someone puts it in front of me because Paul says, eat, don't eat whatever they set in front of you, okay? That's not what it's saying. If they come to the knowledge of the truth, they're going to one day ask you, why did you eat that in front of me if it's wrong? Right? Does that make sense? But he's talking about food that was offered to idols and things that don't really mean that big of a deal. Um, there's a way to use our, our liberty for others to stumble. Are you with me, yes or no? Paul here is speaking about Things that we personally prefer to do. Are you, talk, are, are you with me? Things that we personally prefer to do that are not necessarily against the of God, but they may not be exactly God's ideal for our lives. Are you with me? Does it make sense? And he's saying that there may be a brother or a sister who is new in the faith, or there may be an unbeliever that's among me, and if I'm partaking in things that may not necessarily be compromising God's truth, but they may not be God's idea, ideal, it can cause another brother to what? To stumble. Are you with me? It can cause him to stumble. And Paul says that because of that concept, even though it's what I want to do, I'm going to use my liberty and my freedom to redeem that brother rather than doing my own preference. He says, I'm going to sacrifice and deny myself that it may not be a hindrance to that brother's salvation. In other words, he says, I'm a debtor to all men and I'm going to do whatever it takes to be the very best example for my brother and sister that I can for Jesus Christ. Whatever I do, I'm going to do all to the what? To the glory of of God. How many of you are thankful for that today? There's a to use our liberty. And God gives us liberty so that we might demonstrate His will for others and they also might receive what? Liberty. Amen? The reason that God established this nation in freedom and liberty is because he wanted it to be a uh, launching pad for the gospel to go to all the world through this nation, just like he did with ancient Israel in the Old Testament. Are you with me? And that's the reason he gave it. And brothers and sisters, we take liberty and our freedom in Christ with a grain of salt and think that it entitles us to do whatever we please, even if it doesn't break the commandments of God because we are called to be debtors to all men. Yes or no? We are called to live our lives to God's ideal, not just, not, just, not just enough to get by, but we are called to live our lives to God's ideal that it may be a living witness. And we use our liberty to set others free. Amen? Yes or no? One more verse. 1 Peter chapter. 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 16, 1 Peter 2, and verse 
Let's go to verse 15. He says, For this is the will of God, that by doing what? You may put to silence the what? Ignorance of foolish men. As free, not yet using liberty as a cloak for what? For vice, or in other words, wickedness, but as bonds of God. What's Paul saying here? He's saying, very simply this, the purpose of true freedom is not to do whatever I want as, in the sense of choosing evil, but the true purpose that God designs in freedom is to do what? It's to do good. True, the purpose of freedom is in doing good. And notice what he says. He says, in doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Do you understand why there are so many mockers of Christianity today? Do you understand why there are so many people who think Christianity is a joke? Why they mock it? Let me tell you what, friends. In the dark ages, when people were going to the sword for their faith, people were not mocking Christianity. People were, the church was growing by droves because they saw the peace and the joy on the face of these people as they went to their death. The reason why there's so much mockery today is because we are using the freedom and the liberty that Christ has given us for vice, for pride, for habits, and for all kinds of other things that God has said is not my ideal. That's why. And that's why we have mockers in the church. If God's people will rise up and they will repent of their sins, and they will turn away from wickedness, if they will turn their hearts wholly and completely to the Lord, and they will receive true liberty from Him, which is freedom not from, not from uh, earthly things, but from sin in their lives, if they will do this, it will silence the mockers. It will silence the skeptics. It will silence who speak evil against God's people, and God's people will shine forth like the sun. How are you using your freedom today? Are you using it to do good? Are you using it to silence those who would speak evil against God? Or are you using it for selfish indulgence? that causes people to mock the God of heaven. Because if that's the case, let me tell you, you are a slave of the most pitiful circumstances. But if you are free, we lay aside our own preferences, our own desires, that the God may be seen through our lives and others might be drawn to Him. Maybe today we need repentance. Maybe we need repentance for how we've used our liberty and our freedom. Maybe today we need repentance because we're slaves and we need to be set free. Liberty always has a cost. Liberty always has a price. Liberty is not free. Freedom is not free. It always costs. America's freedom cost the lives of millions of Americans. Spiritual freedom cost the life of God's dear Son. It might be free for you, but it wasn't free for them. We need to have freedom's freedom. Amen? Freedom's freedom. That the freedom that Christ 
has given us as the ultimate freedom. But that freedom is not meant to be kept to ourselves. It's meant to be lived for others. And the freedom that we possess is not just simply for our enjoyment, but it's for, through the grace of God, doing good for the lives of others. Do you need repentance today? Have you misused that freedom? Have you caused your brother to stumble? Have you caused an unbeliever to stumble? Then allow Jesus to change your heart today. And go forth today, free men, free women, in Christ Jesus. There's neither Jew nor Greek, rich or poor, slave or bond, male or female, black or white, Indian, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? How many of you want to have freedom's freedom today? Let's all stand together as we sing our closing song. Number 216, when the roll is called up yonder. I'm going to invite Justine to come forward. We're going to present her with her baptismal certificate following our closing song. When the roll is called up yonder. This morning, maybe you need that repentance in your life. Maybe you've been a slave. Maybe you've been a slave and you need freedom. You desire freedom. Maybe today had freedom, but you have abused that freedom. And you need repentance to be set free that you might have freedoms, not just freedom, but freedoms, freedom. As we pray today, I invite you to invite the Lord to speak to your heart about whatever it is you need and ask Him to give you that repentance. Turn your hearts to Him and experience the joy of freedom's freedom. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, this morning, 
We just thank you for the precious truth that we have in freedom. And Lord, today, only Christ can give us that true freedom that we so need, freedom. And Lord, today we ask that your Spirit would touch our hearts, that we would have repentance for whatever it is, is uh, keeping our lives from being wholly surrendered to you. So I pray today, Father, that you would walk into the doors of our hearts and you would dwell there and the Spirit of God would touch our lives and then we would return to you wholly and completely. And may we truly know what it means to be free in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you today for the truth that you give us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. I'm going to invite Justine.